All right, thank you. So welcome. So uh, we are here tonight. We're going to talk about rainwater system maintenance and then a little bit about simple grey water systems. Um, and rainwater, I guess, rainwater reuse systems in Sydney is, is very important for Sydney because we just have a, a, a finite amount of collection for our, our main water system. It collects into our hook, mainly our Hawke's Spree Nepean um, river system. There's about 10 dams that we collect in. And as Sydney's population has just continued to grow and grow, the water supply has, has always been a, a constraint on, on Sydney and an, an important thing. So we've just had a very wet season and we know that our our wet seasons tend to come in sort of around about 10 years sort of cycles and so so do our droughts. So starting from now, probably there's a good chance we'll move towards drier and drier and eventually we'll hit a, a drought. And it's what we do between now and when we get into really deep drought that's going to make the big difference to leaving water in our dams so that we, we last through it all. So this is, um, I guess, focused on all the people who've got rainwater systems or are about to put in rainwater systems, like some of the people here. And because um, I think only maybe half of the rainwater systems in Sydney are probably working, probably the other half for various reasons aren't. So maintenance is really important that we do have those rainwater systems working and, and contributing to our water supply. So um, can we start the presentation? I'll just click through and it starts mine. Beautiful. Okay. So rainwater system maintenance. So unlike your mains water, which just sort of comes out of a pipe, which you probably don't even see, it comes underground and into your house. And there's nothing you've got to do with that pretty much. Um, rainwater systems have lots of components. So the system components include um, the, the roof, but also what's hanging over the roof. It includes the gutters, um, the leaf guard, if you've got them fitted, that um, stops stuff getting into the gutters. They include leaf shedding rain heads if you've got them, things that are going to stop stuff that's coming down the downpipe and going into your tanks. You'll probably have the first flush diverter. They're actually mandated now for um, rainwater systems if if you don't want to um, lodge, go through the planning application process. They need maintenance. There'll be an inlet strainer. That, that's inlet strainer one of my tanks. You can see not too much maintenance has happened there. Um, and then, of course, there's the tank itself, needs maintenance. There might be a pump. Those things have, you know, they need um, attention as well. And finally, there might be filters. To, if, if you've got um, things in your house where you're using rainwater and, and the water needs to be filtered before you use it. So a big range of stuff that we're going to look at the maintenance of. So we'll start at the start. So here we have a, a roof here. I'm not sure if that shows in the shot. Um, um, so you, the roof of your house, if, if that's obviously covered in a lot of mess, um, then that's going to contribute to what goes into your tank. That's going to maybe mean there's uh, more maintenance needed generally in your system. Uh, and then, as I said, what hangs over your roof is also important. So the roof that drips off some gum trees may contain tannins. Uh, you might not want the tannins uh, sort of coming into your tank. So part of the maintenance for rainwater systems, if you've got, say, um, eucalypts or or uh, some of the wattles, pecans, there's a range of plants drop a lot of tannins. Part of your maintenance might be annually pruning those things so that the drip line from those trees isn't directly onto your roof. And that will really, really reduce the amount of tannins going in. If all you're doing is just watering your garden, that might not be a problem, but that might be something, an annual prune of what hangs over your roof. Thing is, um, goes on the roof and then goes into your gutters. So gutters can fill up with leaves and debris. That leaf and debris can then form dams in the gutters. And this is also a problem if your gutters don't actually have slope, if they sort of have sagged, but you get these big puddles, they're full of leaves and debris, and then that will rot then you've got sort of the rot becomes organic matter. And then when it next rains, that goes into your tank. If we keep the gutters clean, you're not going to get those dams happening in your gutters and therefore not getting that buildup of organic matter, which will flow into your tanks. So 
we we need to make sure the gutters are clean uh, and that might mean like a quarterly say cleaning out of your gutters or the other alternative is to fit a, a suitable leaf guard just to stop the stuff getting into your gutters so um that's the sort of next thing have any of you guys got um roofs with gum trees hanging over them or things like that that's fine yeah that's fine i have had clients with things um like gum trees um like tallow woods big canopies right up just massive amounts of tannin in the water canopy right over the roof yeah that's right it's that it's actually the water that if you look under gum tree you'll see pretty much directly under the where it, the actual leaves are you see if it's paved you'll see it's quite brown on the paving and it's, yeah it's, if it's over to the side you know some leaves will blow over there there'll be a little bit there's nothing like the amount it won't be a problem not not from a tannin point of view so that's what i'm saying about the the leaves and debris can can block the flow rotting adds to the nutrients and then that's going to make the contents of the tank um get more debris in it and, and lower quality quicker so we may need to quarterly clean out the gutters or we fit leaf guard, but don't do that. It's fantastic, isn't it? Or, or yeah. All right, so leaf guard. So um, we've got a little bit on, we've got some leaf guard on, on this roof here. This is a pretty similar product as, as what we've got in, in real life here. You can see just gets screwed, clipped on, and then there's a, a strip that you can see in the slide goes along the top of the gutter and fixes it there. Um, and the idea is that we're just stopping that big leaf up, leaf build up inside our gutters. So, um, but still, um, suspended sediment can still build up under leaf guard. So you can have a fully leaf guarded gutter, but a fine sediment will build up in the gutter. That won't be a problem for everyone, but you might also then need to use a jet that blasts through your mesh and can clean out that sediment or you have sections that you can unscrew and get a hose in there and clean out the sediment that's more likely to be every few years not um not a sort of an annual thing the next thing then after the leaf guard so you might not have leaf guard you might instead say for whatever reason flat roofs don't suit leaf leaf guards very well um the other thing you can do is fit a leaf shedding rain head a leaf shedding rain head is something oh in the next slide oh now what have i done so leaf shedding rain head so we've got one here the water's coming down the downpipe and then hits an angled screen so um now if i take the roof off we can see this more clearly oh there's my table Yeah, leaf shedding rain head. Oh. So it's a leaf shedding rain head. So the water's come out of the gutter into our leaf shedding rain head. Just means instead of going off to our tank, it's going to build up on here. Some of it might slide off. The great thing with these is they the best ones now are designed so you can take them off. So after the rain, get all the stuff off it, put it back, and it's ready to collect collect the water again. So that might be something you might do. Um, monthly or maybe after it rains check check the leaf shedding rain heads so they need to be at a height you can reach and clean them out then the next thing um, that you might have and probably will have is is a, a first flush diverter so a first flush diverter is um there's, there's a miniature one here this would normally be you know uh, as tall as a person sort of thing but there's a vertical pipe with a ball in it um and the idea is that, um, Mel, if you can just, oh, I'll go to the next slide, sorry. Um, when it rains, see if it runs for us, <laughs> tempting fate. So when it rains, the first bit of water running off a roof is going to be quite dirty. Um, so we want to divert that. We don't want to send it to the tank. So we have this separate chamber. And the idea is that the ball floats up, it hits that. Um, the ring that's glued up inside the first flush diverter. A bit hard to see in there, but 
that seals it off so we don't want all that dirty water getting remixed with our clean water and, and taken off to the tank. So we've got our first flush diverter and, and basically all the muck ends up down in here. And I've, I've sometimes gone to clean mine out and there's like a foot deep plug of um, fine leaves and stuff in it. So we have to clean this out, maybe monthly, um, you know, check them out because if we don't clean them out, they they're basically, the idea is that you know, the water drips out the, the bottom. There's a very fine hole in the bottom of these things. So we've got to um, clean them out. So I think I've got a few slides of what cleaning them out looks like. So this is me cleaning, cleaning mine out. So first of all, you, you screw the little cap off the bottom. There's a tiny hole in there. You might have to clean that out. There's a, a filter. Um, this is what they look like clean, but obviously they get, they get very clogged up. And once they're fully clogged, then the whole thing stops flowing. So we, we clean this. And the point of this filter is if you didn't have it, this, this tiny hole would block very quickly and you'd be having to do the cleaning too often. So the filter sort of keeps it protected, but eventually that all gets mucky. So you clean that up. Then sometimes you'll also um, need to screw, screw the cap off the bottom and then clean the muck out of that and put it all back together. That might be a monthly sort of job. You don't want to have too many first flush diverters or the, the whole job gets uh, quite big. So, um, yeah, you can come and have a look at that later. Okay, the next one then, this is our last protection of our tank, is the actual inlet strainer of the tank itself. So we'll get our first flush diverter out of the way. So our inlet strainer, um, Typically, it's stainless steel mesh these days, um, usually in a molded plastic basket, and it's quite fine. And generally, you need to be able to pick that up, take it off, and clean it out if, if, it's, if it's in a situation where it gets stuff in it. So a lot of tanks, you'll see they're screwed down, and they come delivered. makes it really hard to, to maintain them. So you might have to take a few um, screws out so you can lift it out. If you're living rurally like Barry, you might have to just check that it's still there. Like they do blow out, they blow off, blow off tanks, and it's really important to to have make sure these screens are here, partly for the cleanliness of the water, but also to stop mozzies breeding in the water, because we don't want mozzies breeding because that's a big health risk. So the inlet screens, and then also um, yeah, so clean them say monthly if you don't have leaf shedding rainheads. So leaf shedding rainheads obviously are going to stop a lot of that stuff getting to your inlet strainer. It's not so crucial. The other thing you might have to just check, um, you also should have screens on the overflows. Just make sure that it's still there and not jammed open or something again, so the, so the mozzies can't get to your tank. All right. Now, so that's all um, the sort of maintenance that happens fairly often through the year. The next thing is, the tank itself. So despite all that stuff, the suspended sediment is still going to flow through all those bits of mesh. That The dust that's on your roof and stuff is going to wash through all that. We're going to divert some in our first flush diverter, but some still going to get into the tank. So we need to, they say every three to five years, um, get the sludge out of the bottom of your tank. Now, if all you're doing is just um, watering the garden with it, it's not such a big issue. But if you say you're drinking it, you're washing your clothes, showering, all that, then it's more important to keep the the sludge level down to a, a reasonable level because we don't want it too much of it getting sucked up, pulled, pulled through the pump and into the system, which will, I mean, you might be drinking it and stuff. And also it's going to start, if, you, if you've got lots of filters in the system, it'll just start clogging filters fast. So you can just pay someone to come and do this. That's quite a nice thing to do. Um, or if you've got, I don't know if the, the camera points to the bottom of these, but you might have a valve on the bottom of the tank you can just open. Um, let's so say a time when the tank's nearly empty. Um, open up the valve, get a hose squirted around. You're going to have to work through the top of the tank, maybe the long handle broom, push all the sludge over towards that valve and, and clean it out that way. So that's the sort of old school way. If they're big enough tank, you can jump in there and do it. The other way 
that they're shown in the, this slide here is you can siphon it out. So if you've never done a siphon, you basically need to get a hose completely full of water and, and hold on to the ends somehow, plug the ends, put one end into the tank and the other end's outside. And as long as the level of the tank is higher than the water in the tank, then then the level of the end of the hose outside, once you let the ends go, it'll start sucking water out of the tank. What I do is when I've done this once, taped a long pole to the end of the siphon. And then, and also I also taped the bicycle head torch onto the pole so I could see what I was doing and start vacuuming basically up the sludge and, and had it squirting out onto the lawn. They generally will siphon it out and some of them also bring a big bladder tank to make sure they keep all the water and they'll put as much water back in as you want as well. Um, you have the try and have the inlet, the inlet to the pump floating. That's right. Not the pump itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So um, the last and no, oh no, not the last. Um, the next thing then we've we've got the water into the tank. Now we want to get it out. Um, so we we generally use a pump. And pumps need maintenance. So, as I said, a lot I'd say a lot of the the pump, a lot of the rainwater systems in Sydney aren't working. A lot of the, the it's because the pump's not going anymore, and there's an automatic mains water backup. So, what you need to do is, if you've got that situation, turn on something you know is fed by rainwater, garden tap or flush or toilet, whatever you, it is that you know is fed by the rainwater, and then go and put your ear near the pump or beside the tank if the pump's in the, the tank and you should be able to hear the humming of a of a pump running. If not, then you've got to work out why it's not running. So one thing that happens is the float, a lot of them have a float switch that will, when it drops down, which says, you know, the tank's empty, um, then don't run the don't run the pump anymore because we don't we don't want to run the pump when there's no water in the tank. So maybe that float has got stuck somehow against the side of the tank or whatever reason, or it's just jammed or something. It's not moving freely. You need to check that. Once you've got a pump that's running, you need to check you've got good flow and pressure. So it shouldn't just be coming out in a gentle trickle. Most most pumps will it, be a really strong jet. If that's not happening, then probably the pump has lost prime somehow, which means it's, it's got some air in it. So any, any pump can can get um, air in it and it's, and there are self-priming pumps, but even those sometimes struggle a bit. So you'll have to re-prime the pump, which we haven't probably got time to go through now, but um, it's a matter of just getting all the air out of the pump. Okay, this is the last thing that I'm gonna maintain, that's filters. So if you've got filters, um, they, need, they need cleaning, um, Replacing, you you notice the flow's got too slow sometimes. Um, then you say, oh, probably the, the filters are all clogged. So some pleated filters can be washed them. Um, just get get a hose, the normal sort of spray nozzle, not not like a pressure hose, and and just wash all the dirt out of them and then put them back in. And if it's on drinking water, then really should replace them annually. So they say that. Might, after a year, you know, enough bacteria might have built up, up on them that you should throw them away and, and start, start a new. So that's pretty much, so it's quite a lot more than just the pipe coming into your house with main water, mains water. But in summary, um, starting at the gutters, there might be like twice a year you need to get up and clean your gutters, say. Maintaining your inlet and outlet screens, maybe four times a year, just make sure they're there and not too blocked up. And first flush diverters. So um, remember these these things with the the ball and the the valve, uh, maybe uh, monthly. Water filters, maybe once a year. And tanks, um, desludging tanks, maybe looking at a three to five year sort of desludge your tank. Now there are some um, Sydney Water has some maintenance videos, and they were developed by. Uh, Hunter Water Corporation, they, and they're really quite good. So they show things like cleaning out um, the first flush diverter and a few things like that. So that's all on the, the Sydney Water 
um, website there. Um, and I've also included just a few a few websites there for reference. So there's the Sydney Water one, which have quite a lot of stuff about rainwater. There is a rainwater tank design installation handbook. I think you better buy that one. And the plumbing code um, in the Na National Construction Code as well. And the last one's just my um, my uh, website. So that's rainwater maintenance in a 15 minute um, block. Um, so we can take a few questions now and then we're gonna have a look at uh, the grey water systems. So, yes. I got a uh, Christmas tree overhanging my roof. Yeah, like a, a you mean Australian Christmas tree? Yeah. Yes. And the flowers and leaves are really, really tiny. Yes, they are um, fine, yeah. How do they affect the first flush diverter? So if you've got really thanks thanks for the question. Yeah, so when you've got root Australian Christmas bushes or jacarandas or a lot of stuff with really fine leaves, um, you're gonna it's really better to handle it if you can with either the gutter guard, if it's a quite a steep roof, you could do a, but it has to be a fi very fine leaf guard. So the mesh needs to be like a one millimeter sort of mesh or fit these um, leaf shedding rain heads on your, on your down pipes. It's just a much better place to, to deal with it. If you don't, it will just go into the first flush diverter and they, they will cope, but they will fill very quickly with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of material. Where did you get the clear uh, plastic outside? The this, so that that is, you know, I got it from a plastic supplier, but that's just because it's a display model. Yeah, yeah. I have one. So I know when the, <laughs> um, when it was when somewhere in Arncliffe. I think it was a shop in Arncliffe had a clear pipe. Yeah, yeah, a plastic supplier. Yeah, it was uh, somewhere in Arncliffe. I Thanks. think. It was. Yeah, thank you. Is there any other questions from the floor? So just, just to be clear, so you'd have one of those first flush diverters just near your tank. If you've got multiple tanks, you'd have multiples or? Yeah, so that's a good question. So um, normally you'd have maybe more than one downpipe going to a tank. And I would ideally want to have just one first flush diverter just before the tank. Um, it, the more... Of, so they do just slowly drip water out. So you're sort of losing water while you're doing it. Um, so yeah, aim for one just before each tank probably. Maybe one for about uh, every say 50 square meters of roof. If you've had a hundred square meters of roof, I'd be happy to have a couple of them, maybe one on each side or maybe go to a bigger one, like a 20 liter one. Yeah. I've got one question. You mentioned um, in passing pumps inside tanks. Yes. And I've only encountered these recently. How do they work from a maintenance point of view? Are they, they are, you obviously can pull them out, but are they more problematic in that term, in that regard? Uh, yes. So um, submersible pumps are good in some ways in that they're quiet because they're sitting in the water and they don't have the, the loss of prime problems as often because they're, they're sitting underwater. But um, maintenance can be tricky because sometimes sometimes plumbers hook them up in a way that it's not easy to get them out. So what you have to do when, when they're installed, there needs to be a union, like an, a, an easy to un, unscrew union, which is like a plumbing fitting yeah. design so you can take stuff apart. Um, just up near the top of the tank or just above the top of the tank typically um and a, and a big a big enough um enough space so you can maneuver it and then take the pump up and out through the the yeah, inlet strainer yes yeah, so, so, so using your example there you would need something where you lift up your leaf guard and then you could lift up the opening underneath so yeah. you can pull out a pump is that that's what you mean? right so it, it would be probably you'd put the union just under there so you can reach in there undo the union and then bring the pump up which will still have a there's still an electrical cable going down to it as well um but yeah so it is tricky just from a getting to them point of view otherwise they are just locked down there in the bottom of the tank and it's really hard to get to them and the other thing is that they 
they are always sitting down there in in the sludge typically you can sit them on like a brick or something so they're 100 mil off the bottom you, you're going to not access that bottom 100 mil of your tank in that case um, you can also um, have a submersible pump down there and have a floating inlet to it so that it's not sucking from the sludge layer and that's one way to not have it dealing with the sludge all the time because if i do what you just described then i can check for the sludge i'll lift up my pump, <laughs> and the sludge, and the pump and you could you could that's right but yes short answer yes um it's a bit harder to maintain submersibles yeah um we've got some questions online yep um straightforward one what is the problem caused by tannin um, so tannins, um, one, one simple thing is that it just looks yellowish. So surprisingly, we don't like when we flush the toilet to see yellowy water in there. And the whole idea is you flush the toilet and it looks clean then. And so it's a really big resistance now from plumbers to even put in toilet flushing just because, you know, um, they have clients who've come back and said, oh, the water looks yellowy. And so they don't want to do it just straight up, whether there's a tree there or not. So there's just that discoloration of the water. The other thing is that once there's tannin in the water, it, if there's a, a not enough oxygen getting to that water, it will potentially turn anaerobic. So it's a particular problem with bladder tanks, um, some underground tanks, anywhere there's not much oxygen getting to the surface of the water. And once you get anaerobic digestion, then the whole tank goes very stinky in a very horrible way. So um, that's the other problem with tannin. So it's a, just a discoloration thing and potentially anaerobic digestion. Yep. Um, one more question. Um, any recommendations on good um, quality leaf guards and good first flush diverters? Um, I don't have any direct recommendation on good quality leaf guards. It is a bit of a uh, horses for courses thing. If, if you've got really fine, fine leaf trees, like someone in the audience here was saying, then I would be going for a one mil mesh uh, stainless steel um, leaf guard product. And if it's, if it's just regular um, big size leaves that are blown in from somewhere else, then, um, you know, there's a, there's a big range of, of sort of mesh products that will work adequately. And obviously in a bushfire zone, you need to go to metal and yeah. No, I don't, I can't say any specifically for the leaf guard ones. For the, for the, um, the leaf shedding rain heads was the other question, was it? Uh, first flush diverters. First flush diverters. So most of the product out there, I mean, I've always used, there's a rain harvesting, which is the name of the brand, rain harvesting brand, um, first flush diverter kits. And yeah, I'm very happy to recommend them. It's a fairly simple, um, technology. The kit just has um, the end caps, the ball, the bits and pieces, and then you obviously need to get some pipe to um, actually form up the volume of it. Yeah. Um, someone's asking you, familiar with the tank vac system? Yes. Um, yeah, tank vac. I have specced it once or twice. So for those who don't know, tank vac is the idea of using a siphon. Uh, except you're using a siphon from the whole overflow of the tank. So if you can imagine you've got the overflow of the tank, um, so we've got our overflow oh, right up the top here, um, and then the water flows down from that. If we take the inside of the overflow in the same size pipe right down to the bottom and then cut a sort of zigzaggy um, crenellated end on it, very close to the bottom of the tank, the idea is that for the water to come out of the tank, it's got to go past that end of the tank, which is right down at the bottom. So it's sucking the sediment out. Um, every time the tank overflows, some more sediment gets sort of drawn out from the bottom. So that's what the tank back system is. Um, so it's a kind of a good idea. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, just one more question. How do you clean eco sacks? They've got two of them, 5,000 litres each, located under an enclosed deck and can only be accessed by a trapdoor in the deck. Yeah, that's a hard one. So I've also got, I haven't got an eco sack, but the same sort of thing, a, a soft sack under my floor. 
And I did, after quite a while, decide I wanted to try and clean it out. And it, I couldn't even manage to roll mine back up to, my, I was thinking I'll roll it up and I'll get it out. And it was, it was just the mechanics of getting to it under the floor and how it had um, interacting with the piers meant it was going to be really hard to roll it up. So if I could, I would roll it up. This is these soft bladder tanks under the floors and probably um, disconnect it, take it back out through the trap door, get it out on the lawn, try and get a hose into it and and sort of squirt it all out that way. Very difficult to clean, I would say. Okay. Um, so now John will give us a, some info on grey water systems. All right. So um, this is um, just a really quick overview of, of grey water use. Has anyone got any a grey water use system? You must have a black water system out there on the farm, Barry, no? Getting installed. Getting installed? Yeah, right. Okay. And what are you getting? Yep. Yep. I think that's a good approach. Okay. So grey water, grey water reuse where you can do rainwater. I would do rainwater first and then if, you, if you've done rainwater and then you can do grey water, um, presumably you're going to replace some of the usage that the rainwater was going to do anyway. So you're only really addressing that little bit that you weren't managing to supply with the rainwater. So it, it slightly reduces, typically will slightly reduce your reliance on, on the mains water, but maybe not so much. So um, it can be a good thing to do. And um, depending if you're in a place that didn't rain much, then rainwater is not going to be so uh, great. On the east coast, just, you know, east bit of Sydney, rainwater can do a lot of your um, water supply. So that's where you go first. Mine's pretty simplistic. I'd probably change it if there's more than just me there. But most of my grey water, I just collected in a basin out of my double sink and... Um, Manual. Give it to all my plants on the veranda and and all the uh, worm farm. Perfect. Yep. Then there's the black water, which uh, I've got a double septic with baffles in it, and that's the septic. Yeah. Yep. So your grey water, you do some manual bucketing. So what is grey water? So we'll just quickly go through. So what comes from the toilet we call black water. What comes from the kitchen sink is black grey black slash grey water. So we can't put kitchen sink stuff into grey water systems just because of grease, you need a grease trap. Um, so we're looking at hand basin, shower, bath, laundry, washing machine, tub. I wouldn't put hand basin in there probably either because, you know, what happens when people had a big night out, sometimes that all ends up, you know, in the hand basin. Some of the chemicals that go down the hand basin. Um, There's one other degree. Um, I did a blower test, and there was a smell in a in in the trap in the in the floor because that particular basin, that bathroom, hadn't been used for a number of months. And my plumber, when he's doing the work now, reminded me that he likes to have the hand basin charging the floor drain area, so True. you always True. don't get the smell from the sewer system. True. So True. we'll get the we'll get the shower and the bath, but we'll ignore the hand basin. Yep, yep. Another good reason. Yep. Why we use it? So it's only worth doing if if um if we have a demand for it. So garden watering um, is the one we can do with simple diversion or toilet flushing and washing machine if you're going to treat it. Why do the risks? Can provide an infection pathway? Mostly not, but um, I just quickly... Ah, so the main thing is that potentially your grey water could go under the fence and someone who's not in your family could get infected. So basically anything that might might end up in your grey water that's infectious, probably everyone else in the house, in your own household will have it anyway. So um, the only risk is if grey water irrigation leads to someone in who's not in your family getting it. Um, the other thing about grey water, it, it can damage plants and soils. So particularly salt um, and oversaturation. Phosphorus a little bit, but um, not such a big thing. But salt, very big issue. The clayer your so soils, the more that could be an issue. Um, nutrients in waterways, if you happen to back on with some waterways. So 
So how do we prevent it? Don't overwater. Pretty simple. Check for the phosphorus tolerance of your plants. Most plants love phosphorus. Just some hakeas, gorillas. There's a few very special Australian plants that are very adapted to not having phosphorus. But also most of our laundry detergents are, don't have phosphorus in them for other reasons. So not usually not a problem. The easiest thing in terms of um, avoiding this problem is using a laundry liquid. Um, they, ha they typically have very low um, um, sodium and, and they already have low, low phosphorus anyway. So if you're, if you're irrigating plants with your grey water, that's a good sort of good way to do it. Landfax Labs, um, a, a dude up in Armadale just tests all these, runs all these different detergents through his washing machine and then tests the, the sodium and, and phosphorus content of the resulting water that runs out and, and tabulates it all and you can get it all online. Fantastic. That's the sort of thing it looks like. So the, the blue is the, the, so, the sodium content, the, the red is the phosphorus content. What we want to stay under, I know if we get a point here, but yep, we want to stay under that sort of 20 um, milligrams per litre. Um, and you can see that for liquids, it's just easy. So they, they just tend to all be way under it. All right, our main app options are what, what Barry mentioned, bucketing. This is probably one of the best methods of reusing grey water because you know exactly what it's from. Um, like if someone was sick, you wouldn't do it. If it was bath water, for instance, if it was super salty or something, you wouldn't use it. So very good. You can also have a diverter system like this gentleman's thinking of doing. So we're just going to simply divert the grey water. It's not going to be treated. Um, we're just going to divert it into the garden to subsoil irrigation. For diversion, no council approval. As long as you meet some standards, it has to be a watermark uh, approved stuff. Actually, I think they've dropped that. No treatment. Just We're just going to filter out the lint. No storage um, above 24 hours. So it can store for a little while in a sump and then fill a sump and then pump out, but not, not nothing over 24 hours. And it has to go to subsurface irrigation. This is, after bucketing, this is the, the cost-effective, energy-effective way to reuse grey water if you've got a demand for it, if you really need that water for your garden. No point doing it otherwise. If, if your garden doesn't need it or you can do it all with rainwater, no real point to do this. Um, and all those other things. The other thing, if you want to go to toilet flushing washing machine, then you need a treatment system. This is an expensive, very expensive system. Um, so I'm just going to, this is, this is an example of a diverter. Grey flow, I would strongly recommend as a, they're a Western Australian mob has designed a bunch of different grey water diverter systems. And they, they've got them tailored from new builds to um, just a retrofit and also tailored to different depths of, of uh, the wastewater pipes. So wastewater pipes are, can end up at different depths underground, so you need different systems to suit. But they just essentially have, um, they can collect from those things we talked about. They have some simple filters just to take out the lint. And then there's a... Uh, a pump box that has a like a sump that fills up and then once it gets to full then it activates a pump and it pumps it out into your drip irrigation system. That's what I would be getting if I needed one. The other way is treating it. That is, this is the expensive way. Um, you can, the, and the benefit of this is you can do toilet flushing and, and wash your clothes with it. It effectively has to be treated to like an A um, class water. It has to be um, accredited by New South Wales Health as a register of accredited grey water treatment systems. And you can go and look at all those. The only one I would really recommend out of those strongly is the root zone system um, because it has a very low energy use. There are some other very good systems in terms of their treatment and stuff, but um, a lot of them have an aerator that uh, runs, they have a UV light that runs and all these things just use energy. And so the amount of energy per litre of treated water you end up with 
is very high. So um, that's the problem. The costs of it, um, a diverter, an irrigation may be costing you, you know, between a thousand and three thousand dollars. Um, the Nox diverter isn't here anymore. Uh, treatment systems, you're looking at, you know, 10 grand plus. Often there might be an extra tank because you've got to store the treated water somewhere. Some systems have that integrated. Then there's the running costs, um, power for pumps, power for running a UV disinfectant light. Um, there should be a, a back testable backflow device. You might need backflow testing every year. Um, replacing UV lights, it all adds up. So that's, I think that's, um, it's, it's a nice idea and maybe in, in a place where you don't get as much rain, then th there's a place for it. Um, but otherwise, diverters are the go. And there's some reference. Um, there's the Landfax Labs one. I don't know why the health New South Wales one ends up in yellow, but that's the listing of the different um, grey water treatment systems. All right. So that was a very quick run through, but um, we'll let Graham um, do a Q&A. &A and um, thank, thank you, John. Are there were any questions from the floor? This is a comment. Comment. I'm just thinking of the beauty of being out in the bush and you be, use your own creativity. And I have a lot of that. Yeah. Very nice. Yep. I have a question for the diversion that I'm intending on doing. Yep. Um, that you're saying we don't need approval for it, and yet they're saying it must be subsurface. And you're talking about having to dig trenches and put pipes on the ground, like the, the hoses, right. I assume. Yeah, so, so if, but, you, if you follow um, the, the list of... Thing. It's a bit like a SEP, like uh, th these are things, if you follow all these things, you don't have to seek uh, like a section 68 approval to, to operate a wastewater treatment system. So it has to be subsurface um, and that list of things. But just, well, my point is it just seems strange. On the one hand, they say you have to do this. On the other hand, they don't, there's no checking of that. So Yeah, yeah, understood. So that's what's a bit strange. I mean, Well, the lack of checking, I guess, is a bit of an issue, yeah. But, yeah. Okay. My understanding is with the treatment systems, they have to be checked, inspected once a year. Is that yeah, still... treatment systems? You have to have a maintenance contract as well. So um, it's another another expense. Another expense, yeah. Okay. Before you can actually get the approval, you have to have that maintenance contract. Any, okay, um... we we have more online questions, but none for. Um, Grey water systems Back to are the rainwater. Rain, the rainwater. Yep. Um, is a gate valve a good way to flush out the sludge? You indicated a valve at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a nice, simple way. Just having a, a ball valve, a gate valve at the bottom of the tank. That way, it doesn't have to all go through the pump. You can just um, you know, choose a time when the tank's pretty much empty anyway, and uh, you know, it's been no rain for ages. You've seen oh, there's lots of sludge down there get a hose um, and um, a long handle broom and try and push it all out um, out through that ball valve, yeah. Good plan. Are there any leafless gutter systems you would recommend for a bushfire area? Yeah, so, so the, only, the only leafless system I know is a smart flow gutter. Um, I, I assume that's a thing like a, like a a gutter that doesn't catch leaves is the idea. Yeah. And I, it's a steel gutter, so I assume it would be fine for a bushfire area, but I, I don't know that. But that that's one I'd look at. I'd look at the smart flow gutter, which was developed by a guy in Sydney. Yep. Yeah. Um, Chris is asking, do you need one leaf shedding rain, rain head for each downpipe? Yeah. Although, if you wanted to join two downpipes together and then went to relief shedding rain, that'd be okay as well, yeah. I guess. So, typically you would, but there's no rule about it. Yeah. Patrick is asking if traditional ball float first flush diverters are still popular or are they gradually being replaced with the vortex type inline strainers? I don't really know the, um, the stats on it um, between 
the the floating up um, ball valve one and, and the vortex sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Selma is asking, how do you protect the quality of water in your tank in a bushfire situation? So I guess that's ash and dust. And... Yeah. So with all the ash falling down and that sort of thing, I imagine that's going to end up, if you have a bushfire, it's going to end up in there, I guess. And just the, the things that you've got on the tank anyway, your, your first flush diverter to some degree, um, I guess, if you had the bushfire and and it hadn't rained, you could potentially clean the roof, like get all that ash off your roof before it rained and, and clean out the gutters before it rained, and that would help avoid it getting in. The other thing you can do if you want to clean a roof or you've got to do something on the roof even that's a bit toxic or something, is if you have got first, first flush diverted, you just screw the, the bottom caps out of them and then um, whatever you know, washing off the roof just runs out there, out the bottom of the first flush diverter, so it doesn't doesn't go into your tank. Um, Wendy's saying, I have a wet system and a ring of pipes around my entire house, so it is important that nothing goes down the pipes, but I'm concerned about a general gutter guard due to debris getting underneath. Is there such a thing as individual guards for the top of each downpipe? I guess that's your um, your leaf shredding rain head. Yeah, that's right, Wendy. So yeah, a, a leaf shredding rain head. So um, we got this. This this is the sort of thing. So you just have one of these on each downpipe um, at a height you can reach to, and it has to be higher than the top of your tank. Uh, then it can and it can be just right up under the gutter. As, as um, this one was on our model. And that is a really good protection. So for those who don't know, what Wendy's talking about is um, all her rainwater pipes, the downpipes just go down into the ground and there's a sealed up pipe system. So the downpipes sealed to the, the pipe under the ground and then there's a rise that comes up to the tank. So it stays, can stay full of water and doesn't leak out. And um, a leaf shedding rain head on each downpipe is what will protect that from getting anything in. Oh. It'll stop any major stuff. Sediment will still go through that mesh and, and into the, the tank zone. So, so you've got three or four downpipes all feeding your tank system. Sorry, if you've got three or four downpipes all feeding your tank system, you could potentially, above the height of the tank, because I'm also going to have a wet system yep. um, or charge system, you would have one of those installed in the downpipe. And so each downpipe, you just regularly go and clean it up. And yep. that would reduce the time and the amount of sludge you to get into your first flush diverter. That's right. It stops what goes into first flush diverter and also stops what ends up in your in your charged line. Yep. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the filter, only from my own experience, I know that my pump starts to stress out when that filter's um, getting yeah, clogged. Yeah, clogged. Yep. Um, and I know that you recommended maybe once a year, but I typically like to have a couple on hand so that because I think what you said before ha happens that it gets clogged and then the rain bank kicks in and then it's just Sydney water all the time and right. people don't do that so yeah. do, do you have you a cleaned one sitting there ready to go yeah so I'm just yeah, I, to... I used to do that too yeah yeah clean filter like a filter a new filter so yeah. that when it does go because just kind of you know otherwise you, you've got to clean it but you need you want the water so it's better if you've already got a clean one. You have two, basically. Well, then, because yeah, you you don't find the time and then it's putting stress on the pump. And for me, my pump went after about six years until I realised then I have to desludge and everything else. Right. Um, but so do you have a recommendation where people might be able to best find those filters and that sort of stuff? There, there's a lot of, you know, good filter manufacturers out there just look up the code on google and yeah figure it out yeah yep. yep. i Fair just enough. buy mine online but okay yeah. yep okay yep thanks all right well i that brings us to the end of this session and i'd very much like to thank john for all the information he's given us and hopefully we'll get out there and make sure our tanks are, are functioning properly yes um, get amongst it so thanks again. We um, we are recording this, and we will be able to put it up on our 
a YouTube channel, but it may take a while. But we'll, we'll send out a notice when that happens. And so from us here in Asheville, we'll say good night. Thank you.